Alrighty, well, good afternoon. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And with me today is Cindy Warwick, who is in charge of our Author Talk series, and our speaker for today, John Barrows. Um, I will let Cindy do the introduction, but I just want to go over a few housekeeping items before we get underway. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program today, but feel, please feel free to submit them at any time using the questions box in the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar, this is what your dashboard should look like. If you're using a PC or a Mac, uh, if you're using a mobile device, your dashboard's gonna look a little bit different, but the features will still be there. Uh, first and foremost, in the front here at the top, you have your computer audio settings. Um, this is where you can check to make sure that your audio devices are working correctly. Um, if you do run into a problem, you can always connect to the phone. Um, you can call in and uh, you'll still be able to, to hear the presentation. At any point in the presentation, if you have any problems, please feel free to use this raise hand button here. That'll alert me. I will send you a message in GoToWebinar that'll appear and hopefully be able to resolve any of the problems that you are having. And as I mentioned about questions, there is a questions box in the dashboard. Just type in your questions, hit send, and that'll get sent to us. And again, we'll be happy to, to address them at the end of the program today. So that is everything that I have for you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy. Hi everybody, I'm so happy that you could be with us this afternoon. Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking about land pirates of Monmouth County. Now next week, the State Library has, um, well, now I'm thinking I'm saying next week, we always have some interesting events that are coming up and we encourage you to check the website. But on Wednesday, uh, with regard to Juneteenth, on June 15th, there's a virtual hackathon where you can help type in information from advertisements on enslaved individuals who fled to freedom. Um, I've done this one time, they had it a couple of years ago, um, and I, I did it and it was very interesting um, and informative and, and a little sad, but it, it helps so that other people can find these uh, slaves who have gone to freedom. So if you can join in that, that's on June 15th and we do have registration for that on our, web, on our website. Also for information, um, on Juneteenth, a celebration of resistance. I believe that's on the 16th. So there's another uh, thing on Juneteenth. Check out our website again for all the webinars we offer. We've got a lot of good ones coming up. Andrew does a good uh, job of aligning that and co-hosting uh, at times. Uh, the, one of these at least is co-hosted, I believe well, both of them are uh, co-hosted with Thomas Edison State University. Our next talk for the author talk is on July 12th, and it's entitled, You Are Here, a New Jersey Travel Guide. The presenter is Carrie Sullivan. She's the creator of Jersey Collective, which is a regionally popular collaborative Instagram account that serves as a community of people interested in New Jersey and photography. She's also the editor of a new book that just came out June 17th, New Jersey Fan Club. Artists and writers celebrate the Garden State, and that's by Rutgers University Press. So she's gonna be incorporating different things from both of those things into her presentation. You are here, a New Jersey travel guide. All right, that's it for the announcements. Let's get on with the regular program. <laughs> but for today, I wanna to introduce you to our speaker, John Barrows, who's gonna be using proprietary research findings to examine the questions of who were the records of Monmouth County? How did they compare with the people of similar shipwreck prone areas of the world? Were they guilty of the heinous crime accusations that they received? And how did they influence the formation of the US Coast Guard? John is the founder and editor of MonmouthCountyTimeline.org. Take a look at it, it's a really great site. It's a website that presents the illustrated history of Monmouth County, New Jersey. It's through a collection of the best stories from its 400 years of history. And these stories are told by historians in the area. The most important of these stories are highlighted on social media through syndicated graphic features called This Day in Monmouth County History. A longtime passionate consumer of history, John founded Monmouth uh, Timeline in 2000 after retiring from a career in corporate communications and public relations, where he held a position of global responsibility for a Fortune 500 company. 
He's a resident of Little Silver and he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in newspaper journalism from Syracuse University and a master's degree in communication and information science from Rutgers. So I'm really looking forward to this and I'm, I'm sure that you all are as well. Please welcome him with me uh, and let's see what he has to share with us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just get this out of the way. Oh, um, uh, so yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, let's take a little look at uh, uh, <coughs> um, the, uh, here we go. Um, at, uh, Mammoth Timeline is a um, uh, uh, <coughs> website that uh, aggregates uh, to right, right now, just a short of 250 stories across 18 different categories of uh, uh, everything from uh, black history to women's history uh, and um, heroes and celebrities, um, uh, the Revolutionary War, and um, of course, the ever popular ships and shipwrecks. And so the story we're talking about today is uh, from the category of ships and shipwrecks. And, and uh, this is what the This Day in Monmouth County history uh, graphic features look like that we put out on Facebook. and. Twitter and Instagram, and and what you're also looking at there is sometimes when we have stories that are so important that they really just deserve um, uh, illustration where none exists. We have been commissioning artists to create new art. So um, that art you're looking at there, um, the Fatal Showdown of Joshua Huddy, that's one of the most important stories in Monmouth County history. But there was no art; no one had ever imagined how that might have looked. And so we actually commissioned an artist to create that and. Uh, um, so uh, that's a, another thing that we're kind of um, proud of uh, initiating. Um, as for today, um, we uh, uh, are <clears throat> uh, the question, the research question before us is um, stated by um, a New Jersey state senator from Hunterdon County um, who challenged the governor of New Jersey to get to the bottom of this question. The Barnegat Pirates are either the worst scoundrels on the face of the earth or they are a much injured set of men. So that's, that's pretty intense. There's not a lot of middle ground there. And so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a deep look at exactly how uh, the people of New Jersey found themselves at that crossroads. Um, and it's important to have this in uh, the context of um, uh, uh, the timeline. So uh, it, 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 from 1915 onward, uh, you had the United States Coast Guard um, to come to your uh, rescue if you were on a, in a ship that was uh, in trouble close to shore. Um, and uh, for, you know, that meant that you had a pretty good chance at a pretty good outcome. And, but, the, but that from before 1915, uh, there was something called the U.S. Life Saving Service. And um, that was uh, uh, something that came into existence in 1878. And uh, we'll look into a little bit about, about that later, but um, so that what we're looking at here is before 1878. So we're talking about the period of time when there was no organized government response or approach to handling what we what is um, essentially marine salvage. And so uh, the whole question is that before 1878 and for centuries before 1878, um, if your sh ship was in trouble close to shore, there's a very good chance that your life depended on wreckers. Now, wreckers is a term that refers to the people who lived in these far-flung communities, the, the ends of land typically, like Cornwall in the UK, in, in England, um, or, or uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the Bahamas, um, and the Florida Keys, and, um, uh, you know, these are, these are all places where, um, you know, uh, uh, there's not, a, there's not a, a lot of people living, and they, they are typically impoverished communities. Um, and they ha but they happen to be where uh, ships um, very frequently get into trouble. And so these people um, uh, over the years become very adept at figuring out how to get out to distressed ships and um, um, either render assistance, depending upon whose <laughs> angle you believe, um, or uh, essentially help themselves um, to like pirates. Um, so um, we are talking about the era of sail, and this was a a time that was fraught with risk. Uh, and when you look at it, sometimes it's a miracle that any sailing voyage was ever successfully concluded. So 
This is Lloyd's Register of Shipping. This isn't even an old one. This is one of the more recent ones that's available digitally, but this is from 1919. And this is a compilation that Lloyd's puts together of all the ships that were lost from the previous year and uh, what different means uh, they were uh, lost by. And they include abandoned at sea, which, you know, that's always kind of going to be some kind of a mystery. Foundered, that's when your ship runs up on a sandbar and then the waves pound it to pieces. Missing, another mystery kind of thing. Well, we had a ship that left port and was supposed to arrive and we have no idea. It's just missing. Broken up, condemned, burnt, collision. We forget these busy ports during the era of sail. These ships don't have reverse gear. Um, they, they were not very maneuverable. They didn't be uh, very easily controlled. And so this was a very, very serious um, uh, source of um, how ships were lost. Wreck, that's when you run your ship over the rocks and, and uh, get a hole in the bottom and it sinks. Lost, that's when your ship is out there somewhere and you just don't know where. Um, and uh, this is war loss is about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and by the way, just to, just to note, this is not all of the ways that ships, that, that, that ships could get in trouble in the era of sail. These are all the things that happen so frequently that Lloyd's decided we'd better tabulate them on a year over year basis going forward. Um, so that gives you an idea of just how frequently um, ships were um, in need of uh, assistance from, uh, you know, marine salvage. So when we're talking about marine salvage, um, it's, it's, it's a basically a, 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 a system of laws and traditions that typically are, are referred to as maritime law or admiralty law. Uh, this is not new at all. Um, this has been around. These, these, these traditions and laws have been in place in different parts of the world for centuries. And the idea is to protect all of the different parties. And again, this is in, about commercial trade by uh, uh, sailing ships. And there are a lot of different interested parties. You might have the person who owns the ship, but that might the person who owns the cargo that's on board the ship, the person who's insuring the ship, the person who is in the port destination who is intending to buy the cargo, the, the captain, sometimes the captain has some of his own cargo on board, crew, passengers, etc. So there's a lot of interested parties on any given uh, sailing voyage, a commercial sailing voyage, and so maritime law was designed to represent um, everyone's interests and protect all parties. And um, there are, are um, there are written records of uh, such kinds of laws um, going back a thousand years in places like Egypt and and uh, and, and uh, Europe. And um, you know, out of these laws and traditions, you become different procedures for handling different kinds of marine salvage. So, um, cargo from a wrecked ship that is floating in the water is called flotsam. And there might be a different set of rules for who can collect that and what they can do with it from those things that from a wrecked ship that were washed up on shore called a jetsam. And a third one that's lesser known, which is the, uh, those items from a wrecked ship that are on the bottom of the ocean. And that's called lagging. And so, uh, so different these procedures would uh, ended up evolving over the years. And uh, the whole idea with the wreckers is that this was supposed to be a mutually beneficial arrangement for everybody. So the idea is, you know, you're the captain of a ship and you've been blown off course and you're in a bad place. Maybe you're on a sandbar. Um, and uh, so you're in serious trouble. And some people from shore, uh, some locals um, come and offer assistance. Um, their, their first priority generally, sometimes according to law, but to, to tradition either way, is to save the lives of the people on the ship. Secondly, the car save the cargo and valuables such as it is. Those valuables could be everything from brass fittings and ropes and sails, not just always um, cargo in the hold. And the third priority was to save the ship if at all possible. So you as the captain or ship owner, you avoid um, death and a total loss. And those who assist, well, they, they get something for their trouble and their risks. So they're supposed to receive some sort of compensation. So um, pretty much, again, the way it worked everywhere around the world, these wreckers were operating as freelance subcontractors who were all in competition with one another. And so uh, when somebody would uh, notice that a ship was in trouble, um, the wreckers would race to be the first one to get to the ship. And the first one to get to the ship gets to be a wreck master, and that person um, gets to coordinate 
uh, the uh, marine salvage efforts and to marshal the resources. And what do I mean by marshal the resources? Well, some of these um, uh, these wreckers uh, that are that are, are they're either in boats, you know, or, or small sloops, uh, small sailboats, or in rowboats. But uh, in the Caribbean, in particular, um, you would have um, uh, wreckers would be in these smaller boats. If you had a larger ship that was um, hung up on a sandbar, what they would do is they might take five of these smaller sloops and they would double anchor them off the stern. Um, in sort of a fan arrangement, and then each of those five ships would uh, lash a line to the ship on the sandbar, and then all of the men aboard those five sloops would use the capstan, that's the winch for raising the anchor, and they would winch that ship off the sandbar, uh, you know, a couple inches at a time until they could set it afloat again. A lot of times they would need to take all the cargo off the ship before they could do that. And that would take more than the men on any one ship. So they always had to make sure they were had, had enough of resources. You know, sometimes the ship is still taking on water. So sometimes you have to use more men uh, in the shorter term. So the wreck master does all of that. When everything has been done that can be done, the ship and the cargo are supposed to be taken to Admiralty Court. Um, and the Admiralty Courts existed in all of the older um, um, you know, uh, places like um, you know, uh, England and uh, uh, France and so forth. But um, in, in the Americas, uh, for many, many decades, the only Admiralty Court was in the Bahamas, um, which was, of course, a British colony. And um, uh, so uh, at those courts, at the, that's where the value of the salvage and the ship was uh, divided up between the various interested parties with, of course, the state getting to keep a cut of the action as usual. So along the decades and centuries that this was going on in all of these different places, these wreckers came to be consistently accused of three crimes. Um, and this is everywhere. Everywhere there were wreckers, they were always accused of these three crimes. And the first is called inducements. And this is, this is an accusation that where the people on shore did things to cause ship captains to steer themselves into trouble and into a bad place. So it's called inducements, and it usually meant lighting fires, like a bonfire on a cliff, or sometimes there were even accusations that they would hang lanterns around the neck of a cow or a horse, and then while that lantern swung, it would look to a captain out at sea as though he was at the mouth of a harbor where ships were um, at anchor, and, and, uh, and he had reached, uh, he finally had reached safe harbor. Um, and, um, there's a tremendous amount of research that has gone into this. One historian reviewed every single record that was at, uh, before the Key West Admiralty Court during the era, of, you know, before again before the era of wreckers came to an end with the Life Saving Service and the Coast Guard, and he did not find um, one single example of that. So the second accusation is failure to assist survivors. Um, and this uh, comes out of what may even be just a myth. But it's possible that there was at some point in time a law that may have been on the books. It would have been in England, um, but it was it was widely believed that there was a law in place that uh, that held that if a, a wrecked ship was found um, completely abandoned, that those people who found that ship could keep everything aboard it. No Admiralty Court, yours as long as. But if there was even one survivor, one person is still alive on that ship. Boom, the whole thing's got to go to Admiralty Court, and then it's got to all be divvied up. Well, that gave rise to these accusations that these people on shore would make sure that there was no one alive on the ship so they could keep it. So they were accused of murdering survivors. Um, sometimes, a, you know, the, the people from a, a ship that was sinking would, would be able to get off into a lifeboat, and they would make way to shore, and the accusations were that the wreckers would take their oars and sails and personal valuables and push them back out to sea and then let the currents do what they would, and then they would go out and, and uh, um, seize what became known as a, a abandoned ship. Um, there's an interesting vignette from the history of Blackbeard the pirate, where he understood this part of Admiralty law. When he uh, he, t he seized two French ships off of South Carolina, and he emptied all the contents of the ship into one of the boats, and he took all the people from the other ship and put them on the other. And again, he took away the sails, disabled the rudder. So he sent one ship where it was empty except for people and set it off in one direction. And then he went back into port with a ship full of cargo, but no people and said, I found it abandoned. And he got to keep most of it. So that's what this has been around for a long time. Then the third one is the plundering of cargo. And that's, you know, the ship is 
on the sandbar close to shore and the people are able to get out there and they're just keeping everything they can find. So again, lots and lots of research over the centuries shows that the inducement accusation, there's no evidence it's ever happened anywhere. And it doesn't make sense when you really think about it. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Secondly, no evidence to say, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but there is no place where anyone was ever accused or, or tried or convicted uh, of doing this. Um, and I will explain how these accusations could fly around without anyone ever actually being directly accused. In other words, they were accused as a class, but uh, never as individuals or people. And uh, then the third one, plunder and cargo. Ah, yeah, well, what are you gonna do? Look, again, we are talking about impoverished communities at the far flung parts of the world. And this is where, uh, you know, I like to challenge people today. Okay, in the year 2022, who, who out there feels like they've got a really good handle on the law of the land today for finders keepers? Hmm, right? Hey, here's a wallet. There's no ID in it. There's a hundred dollars in it. Can I just keep that? Or am I supposed to turn it in? Would I have to turn it in if it had an ID? Does that make a difference? What if it was a thousand dollars? Is it a, if I keep it, is it a crime if it's a thousand dollars, but it's okay if it's a hundred? I mean, I, I, I ask this question. Most people even today don't know what the laws are for finders keepers. Well, what do you think people in the you know 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries? What were they? What, what kind of um, you know intense uh, logical? It's like now. Oh, wait a minute. Now what can we? Uh, you know, you're starving. Uh, the government doesn't care, and literally food and valuables are washing up at your feet. A certain degree of human nature takes over there. And uh, so we'll look at how the law has tried to um, adapt to that ba basic bit of um, human nature. Uh, so this is an original uh, work of art that we commissioned uh, last year from artist uh, Charlie Swordlow of History Depicted, uh, in which we asked him to imagine what it would be like to be on board a ship uh, that was foundering off of Barnegat if all those accusations were true. And so you see, for example, inducement, you see a bonfire up on the cliff. And the idea is that this captain thought that that bonfire meant that it was like a lighthouse that marked the entrance to Barnegat Inlet. And so instead of staying way off uh, to shore and safe, uh, he uh, steered a ship too close to shore right onto the sandbar that those people knew exactly was where the, the ship was going to go. And um, now you see uh, the uh, murder of survivors, you see the, uh, the, the longboat in the foreground, and you see the people in the background with the blood in the water. That's, that's making sure that there's no survivors. Uh, the people on that ship were hoping that those people were coming to rescue, but now they realize, uh-oh, we could be in a lot of trouble. And then cargo. You look on the shore, and you see people walking away with chests and barrels and crates, and they have uh, carts and wagons loaded. And uh, you can also look at this a little bit differently if, if, and realize what was more likely to be the actual case of what happened here. A ship got blown off course onto a sandbar it couldn't see. That happened all the time. It didn't have to happen because someone lit, lit a fire. But it's close enough to shore where the screams and yells of the people on the ship could be heard. Uh, it's a pretty quiet time in those days, you know, there wasn't a lot of noise. So if you were a local, what do you do? Well, you're going to light a fire so you can see where the ship is. So the bonfire didn't cause the wreck. The bonfire was lit after the wreck so that they could see where the ship was. Then they got, they tried to get their boats to the shore and get them in the water and get out to the ship because that's how you get to be wreck master. That's how you get to save the cargo. And if you're going to save people, and so... You know, if you did it, if you if it was done the other way, the, instead of those truncheons, those those people in those boats would be hauling those people to shore and and saving their lives, um, and because that's actually what happened most of the time. And what what's happening with the cargo is it's not being stolen; it's actually being removed from the beach for um, uh, accounting and safekeeping. Um, because if they just leave it on the beach, it's going to flow flow out again with the with the next high tide. Um, so. Anyway, uh, you see that, 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 that your perspective on what happens in one of these kinds of situations can be very, very different if you're the people on board the ship as opposed to the people on board the land, right? So this is very intentionally uh, um, a ship that's in trouble in a snowstorm. And these people on land 
would be brave, risking their lives to come out and try to save a ship like this in the most harrowing conditions imaginable. And instead, they got accused of being murderers and thieves. So let's just take a look about uh, the original colonies. There were five primary areas in the original colonies that were um, uh, prone to shipwrecks and where wreckers operated. And in all five cases, it was somewhat slightly different. Uh, uh, and so Sable Island uh, off uh, Canada, 150 miles off Canada, it's really just a rocky outcrop, but it's in the middle of the major fishing era. And so uh, the people who were the local fishermen of that era um, were, were primarily fishermen um, to begin with, but they also carried a lot of the equipment that was necessary for, for acting as wreckers. And um, they, they all rendered, they, they, were, they were typical for rendering assistance um, in that area uh, as well. Then the Cape Cod and the Islands, that, that's basically the approaches to Boston Harbor. So obviously in the colonial era, Boston is one of the busiest ports in uh, all of the Americas. Um, but to get in and out of there and go anywhere, you have got to get past Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and there are um, and breakers and, and in around those um, areas. And uh, of course, there were a lot of um, uh, whalers and, and um, fishermen and um, seamen in, uh, in Nantucket. And so likewise, those people probably wore two hats and, and served as wreckers when need be. Um, far more of, of wreckers activities happened around the approach to New York Harbor. And this is both similar um, on uh, uh, the South Shore of Long Island, as well as the Jersey Shore, um, in particular, the further north you go. Um, and then the Outer Banks of Carolina. Um, and uh, in both the Jersey Shore and Carolina, we'll look at this in a sec, um, you, it, you know, in, in um, Sable Island, you have ships that are wrecking because they're, they're, they're getting blown onto or they're in, in, um, not unknowingly steering onto rocks. Um, in, um, and same with Cape Codney Island. So those are where there are breakers. Um, in uh, New York, New Jersey, and uh, um, um, uh, Carolina, this is where you have these shifting sandbars. And so this is where ships tend to founder. And then the last one, and this is the biggest one, is the area of the Caribbean. And so this is an, a time when um, Spain um, has colonized a good part of Central and South America, and they are bringing massive uh, amounts of treasure uh, back to Spain, but they have to get past those islands. They have to get past those islands. They either got to go north of Cuba along the Straits of Florida, along the Florida Keys, where there's a 200 mile reef of of coral that sits just offshore. And so uh, th there's constant shipwrecks almost on a daily basis along the Florida Keys. And then you go the other way, you go on the other side of Cuba, and then you're going through the Bahamas. And there are, are um, uh, breakers in the Bahamas that are so famous that they even have names. Um, and um, so uh, so that uh, the, the Caribbean is by far where the most shipwrecks happened. Um, but what makes the Jersey Shore so dangerous? Well, this is a new picture. Uh, th this is a, a picture from down, uh, down uh, south of here a little bit, not too far, of a brand new sandbar that just nature just created out of what out of sand and this is something that nature has been doing forever and will always do forever and nowadays we can send up a helicopter or a drone and we can calculate exactly what the dangers are and tell you know you know navigators can know where to go and where not to go but as you can imagine in the era of sail you had no way of knowing where you know last time i went by this place it was perfectly safe and now it's deadly and why is that uh prone to our area, and it's because of this odd bit of uh, geography and, and geology called the New York Bight. And you can see it there, you can see where the Hudson River runs south and drains down into New York Harbor and New York Bay, and, and then you see this deep water, natural deep water channel. And so any major ship of any size that was trying to come into New York Harbor was trying to uh, follow the New York Bight, uh, the natural deep water channel, and as you can kind of see, that goes right by the tip of Sandy Hook. And so ships that were trying to uh, uh, navigate the bight um, were frequently blown south um, onto the shores and sandbars um, off of Monmouth County um, and, uh, and, and all the way south um, and with, with um, great frequency. So 
how did newspapers cover all this? So let's talk about how records came to have the bad reputation. We looked at newspaper coverage of records going back to the earliest newspapers that, um, uh, that exist uh, and survive. Um, we actually examined uh, every newspaper story we could find in the English language about records, specifically about records, to get to the bottom of where these bad, uh, these accusations came from um, and, and the horrible reputation that they got, in spite of the fact that a lot of times they were heroic in, 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 uh, in what they uh, attempted to do and what they accomplished. So uh, this is um, 1766 stories from South Carolina. And uh, this is, a, so again, the, the vast majority of uh, our stories about wreckers um, from these early days were these very minor little shipping news briefs. So the Snow Indian trader, Thomas McMinn, master from Georgia for Jamaica, was cast away on the 10th of September on a reef of rocks near the Grand Caicos, one of the Bahama Islands, where the captain, passengers, and crew happily got on shore and were treated with great humanity by some wreckers who after, afterwards carried them to Providence. So we, we in examining all these newspaper stories, um, rated them for whether they were positive or negative or neutral, and we would consider this a positive story. So any of these stories that talked about where the wreckers where somebody was saved or the ship was got off, you know, that's where we talked about where they winch these ships and, and float, refloat them again. Um, you know, those are positive. Um, and then you have negative stories and they tend, the negative stories tend to be a little longer and they tend to have a, um, an, a, uh, an actor, a, 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 somebody who was there, usually the captain of the ship that was involved who, um, wasn't really happy with the way the whole uh, uh, experience with the wreckers turned out. So uh, I won't read the whole thing, but basically the captain, um, you know, his, his ship uh, struck a reef and uh, the, um, uh, the the wreckers came and offered him uh, help. And he said, well, you can have half my the value of my cargo and vessel. And they said, no, we'll, we'll take all of it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know he, he tried to negotiate, and he had no basis to negotiate. He's he's on the deck of a ship, knee deep in water. Um, he has no way to get the cargo to shore. He has no way to get the ship afloat. He really has no basis to negotiate. But he does try to negotiate, and then he comes back, and and he makes it look like he got a really bad deal. You know, he's probably trying to save face, maybe with some of his business partners. But generally speaking, you see that the wreckers are never given a voice in these kinds of situations. It's always somebody who actually had maybe had an ax to grind, and it may not have been a legitimate one. Um, so this is what the negative stories tended to look like. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the neutral stories, of which the, the vast majority, typically would just be, uh, you know, a ship passing by saying, uh, we saw the sloop John B., was uh, uh, caught, uh, caught up on a uh, sandbar and some wreckers were um, alongside rendering assistance. Well, we don't know if that turned out positive or negative, so we have to call that neutral. So if it wasn't clearly negative or clearly positive, it's gotta be neutral. So this is the first story about wreckers in New Jersey and it's negative and it's about the conduct of the part of the people of Cape May County, then most infamous in plundering and carrying off the goods that were washed ashore. A lady who was drowned and whose body came on shore and was stripped of her watch, necklace, and other trinkets and other amounted goods stolen, probably amounts to $20,000, so forth and so on. The collector appears to be honorable and collect men. This would that the same might be said of the wreckers. Now, let's just stop and take a quick look here. A lady is drowned and she washes ashore and she has jewelry on. Are you supposed to bury her like that in a strange land? Because there's a good chance that survivors might come looking for her. There might be relatives who might say, hey, whatever happened to her? What, whatever. So uh, this, this, again, you can look at it from the standpoint of the people on shore um, who might have been trying to do the honorable thing and make sure that her valuables were saved for family members. But, and so once again, you see at the end, the whole class of people get accused of something, but no one person is ever found to have done anything. Um, and so you, know, this, you start to see um, that the wreckers are typically don't get uh, a fair uh, shake in most of these kinds of um, um, stories. So um, now it's ten times worse in England. In uh, in England, um, uh, the, the the stories about wreckers are terrible. And so you know, here's a story that about a ship that uh, 
um, was lost. And for what escaped the fury of the storm fell a prey to the rapacity of the wreckers who numerously infest many parts of the Cornish coast, watching the shipwrecks with the greatest eagerness, when instead of assisting the unfortunate mariners, they too often prevent their escape from a watery grave in order to plunder their property. Think about this. This is really insidious, right? They're basically saying, this ship was probably plundered. They don't actually say it was. They don't know that it was. They don't seem to have any evidence that it was. They just know that if it if it wrecked in that part, it was going to fall to these people. And so they never missed an opportunity to, to uh, smear the people of Cornwall uh, as being murderers and thieves and, and generally the worst human beings on the planet. And that expanded into a punditry and, and opinion writing, where in England, it was very, very um, commonplace for a, uh, uh, somebody who was writing a story who was outraged about the conduct of, say, insurance brokers. And he would say, these insurance brokers are like the wreckers who you know, just uh, wish for ships to wreck and hope for the worst to happen. And if, they, and if it doesn't, they'll make it happen. And whether it's the government or uh, bankers or uh, stockbrokers or all kinds of people, you know, anytime a group of people was supposed to be smeared as rapacious in those days, you would compare them to wreckers. And that started to float across the ocean. And we started to see that happen in North America, specifically in, in New York City and uh, Philadelphia, where opinion pieces um, would make reference to the horrible things done by wreckers without anyone ever having directly accused of any person of having, having done that. And so that brings us to 1834. So why did we read every single newspaper story about wreckers? What was the point of that? Well, the point was that we had to find out whether this next story was usual or unusual. And it's the most unusual story imaginable. And so that's why this is the, this is the key thing. So in 1834, this headline appears in the New York newspaper, Capture of Land Pirates. Look at how long this story is. You've just seen those negative stories I showed you before. Those were the longest stories we found about wreckers up until 1834. And look at this. This is a front page story in a major New York daily newspaper, Capture of Land Pirates, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. We're not going to read it, but I'm going to carry out the highlights for you. I'll call it out. So first appeared in the New York Gazette and Advertiser on the front page. It is by far the longest and most detailed story ever about wreckers. I mean, even after that, there weren't ever any stories that long. It's, it's packed with copious details about four specific shipwrecks off of Barnegat Inlet that had occurred over the previous two years. And the story includes many, many specific names of people, some of whom are famous, real people, uh, including uh, local residents, um, government leaders, uh, that are all you know people who really existed. Um, it repeated all three of the heinous accusations. But it was only picked up by a few other newspapers, which is a little bit curious, because this is an era in which the vast uh, percentage of uh, newspaper content is uh, stuff that was published in other newspapers. And um, so for, for a story that was so salacious, with so many incredible details, so unlike anything that had come before it, um, for other newspapers to not give it more attention, um, is one of the things that made us curious. And of those publications that did carry it, only one newspaper that could be considered a major newspaper, the New York Sun, um, picked it up and ran it the, 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 the next day. Um, but otherwise, all the papers that did pick it, uh, pick it up and run it were, were relatively minor, small papers. And it didn't last long. It didn't have what we call legs in the uh, journalism business. Um, you know, after you know, after just a, a number of weeks, um, the last uh, the last of these stories appeared. Um, when normally stories of of, of that salacious nature, uh, they you still see them showing up in in these newspapers months and months after they originally appear. So why do we think this is a hoax? Okay, so like we say, uh, the vast majority of newspaper content is from other newspapers. But only 20 newspapers, about 20 newspapers, picked this story up. And most of them were from places like Vermont, Western Pennsylvania, and Indiana, all uh, odd places. Um, and isn't that a little unusual? For a story about barning it, um, it didn't get picked up by any newspapers in Philly, 
or New Jersey, including the four daily newspapers in Monmouth County. There's a daily newspaper in Red Bank. There's a daily newspaper in Freehold. There's a daily newspaper in Hastery Park. There's a daily newspaper in Long Branch. And none of them thought that this story was worth covering. No, store, no newspaper in New Jersey picked it up. And one of the reasons is because clearly they smelled it for the, you know, BS story that it is and was. Um, and, and, and there's some reasons for that. In those, in those era, the era of what they called the penny press, newspapers were the primary form of, of entertainment in America, and they blended um, fact and fiction with, with, without any, um, uh, you know, with impunity. They, they, nobody even thought that there was anything wrong with that. And so uh, stories that were meant to be factual were alongside absolute flights of fancy, and it was up to the reader to, to figure out um, which was which. You know, one of my favorite examples of a story that helped perpetuate the Captain Kidd myth in Monmouth County and appeared in one of the, the, the Monmouth Democrat, front page of the Democrat, Monmouth, long story about the sighting of people burying a chest of treasure off, uh, the, off, off a, uh, under a tree off of a cliff near Barnegat. Uh, and uh, you know, there were uh, four swarthy men and a, and a black man and they murdered the black man and threw his body on top of the chest and buried it and sailed off. And, and that, you know, this was Captain Kidd's treasure. And, uh, and then the, the letter goes on to be signed. It's like, and this I swear is true as I was reincarnated and saw it happen myself, signed Captain Kidd. So if you read this long story all the way to the very end, it's clear, it's completely made up. But hardly anyone ever does that. They read like most of the way and they're like, wow, somebody actually saw pirates bury treasure in Barnegat. So this is one of the many ways that, um, you know, uh, myths um, are perpetrated in these newspapers and, and get picked up and spread by other newspapers, but this one wasn't. So a lot of people smelled this as being the dubious story it was. Now, this is also an era where newspaper hoaxes were common. One of my favorites is the New York Sun had a breathtaking series for a number of weeks in 1835 Right. This is 1834. This is this is the period we're talking about, where they just they said that scientists had uncovered a colony of people living on the moon, and so every, every day there was a no update on what scientists were finding about the, about the people living on the moon, and this turned the New York Sun from a also ran into a leading paper. It was a huge boom for uh, circulation, and uh, but another great example from a little bit later on, um, the publisher of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle uh, circulated a forged Associated Press story that was purportedly issued by U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, in which President Lincoln apologized for his physical infirmities and mental frailties and his general apology for not being a better man up to the incredible task um, of his job. And of course, it was completely made up um, and uh, um, only a small number of newspapers picked it up, but enough of them did that it caused a stock market panic. You're never going to guess who cleaned up in that stock market part. Yeah, the publisher of the Daily Brooklyn Daily Eagle. That's exactly what he knew was going to happen. He, he had bought and, and, and uh, sold uh, securities um, based on what he knew was going to happen when that story hit. And that wasn't even against the law at the time. So people, would, uh, people might uh, undertake a, new, a newspaper hoax for, for real reasons, not just for entertainment. And... Uh, then you know, I mentioned that there's a ton of details in this story. We'll just really quick go through some of these just to show that when we when we go through name by name, detail by detail, scratch a little bit, they just don't hold up. So uh, there's a, a mention of, of Judge Betts. Well, there was uh, there's no record of any Judge Betts in that era in New Jersey, but there is a very much many references to a Judge Betts um, who was essentially the chief judge for the what is now called the Southern District Federal Court of New York. Um, um, and uh, so he was one of the leading judges. Uh, he was a federal judge in, uh, for, for the New York City area. Um, and this story basically said that this judge in New York was the person who was in charge of arresting all of the people of Barnegat who got rounded up by the law enforcement as part of this you know, bullshit story. And um, pardon me, sorry about that. Um, and um, uh, that it, it, and of course, that doesn't make any sense because uh, New Jersey had its own federal judge. And the whole point of having these federal judges in these districts was you don't have a judge in New York reaching over state lines and handling law enforcement in another state. So that doesn't make any sense. 
there's a reference to Garrett B. Wall, who was indeed the Attorney General of New Jersey. He just wasn't when this story came out. He, he wouldn't. He, he was, he, you know, and so he was before that. So um, that doesn't hold up. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite. So there's constant references to a guy named William Platt and calling him the wreck master and then saying that he was the ringleader of this Barnegat, these Barnegat land pirates. Um, and uh, this story says that, um, that that the law enforcement had sent had to send officials out to Indiana to arrest William Platt and bring him back uh, to stand trial. Well, couldn't find any record of a William Platt ever standing trial for anything to do with um, a shipwreck. Did find some newspaper stories about a William Platt from Freehold um, who um, was warned by a judge uh, that if he did not return from Indiana to Freehold um, to face uh, the court. Um, that the judge would adjudicate the matter before him um, accordingly. And so I guess we can imagine that William Platt's divorce that his wife initiated probably didn't go in his favor because that's what that was all about. It was a divorce proceedings. So, the, you know, somebody went to a lot of trouble to use a lot of real names. Um, yeah, and William Platt was not arrested in the end and he never returned. To, he, he, let, he let his wife have his, her way. Um, and then, you know, you look at all of the different names of the people. There's like somebody who's called a pirate and all these different these names. None of them ever was written up as standing trial or being found innocent or uh, a, a conviction. Um, and, and then most of the names also cannot be verified. So, you know, now, again, I haven't done everything possible. I haven't looked at census records and I haven't gone all the way down. But just looking at newspaper records like 20 years before and after just to see if any of these people's names were ever mentioned and not one of them was. So, you know, really looking at anything about this that holds water and you can't really find it. And then there's the official documents that refute the accusations. So what, who would do this and why? Well, the first thing we talked about how you mix uh, fact and fiction because that's what sells newspapers in, in an era when newspapers were entertainment. Insurance fraud? What if one of those four shipwrecks off of Barnegat was um, uh, the subject of a bit of a fraud where somebody involved, maybe a captain, maybe the insurer, uh, maybe who, who the person who owned the cargo, um, it would really uh, help his matter as he tries to claim uh, maybe a cargo value that was valued significantly higher than it really was to be able to say, well, the reason you you know you, know, you don't you can't see the cargo is because it was carried off by land pirates. So you're just going to have to take my word for uh, that there was this much worth of it on this ship. So it, we, insurance fraud is probably, in my opinion, the most likely uh, revenge. I don't know. Somebody really seems to have had an axe to grind against Barnegat. Why Barnegat? You know, because um, they said. Two thirds of the residents of Barnegat were implicit in these crimes. So somebody really had an axe to grind against that small town at a time when there weren't a hell of a lot of people living there. Um, can't can't imagine why. But um, and then lastly, this is a bit. This may seem like a stretch, but but stay with me here. Um, War of 1812 is now over. You know, by 20 years, and America is now truly independent and is growing and is a truly independent nation. And, but its image around the world. It's not very good. Um, the United States is largely looked at by the leading um, uh, nations of the world as being a lawless kind of backwater, uh, uh, you know, uh, just you know, place of, of uh, uh, uneducated rogues and criminals, just a lawless place um, uh, of danger. And civic leaders and politicians and newspaper publishers and people of that era of that uh, ilk. Um, were among those who wanted to try and um, burnish America's image overseas. And so sometimes you see stories in like this in which the, the ability of law enforcement and law and order and, 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 and you know, right-minded officials uh, to prevail over uh, Venus criminals um, is, is what America is really all about. So that one may seem like a stretch, but it, 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 really, it really isn't. So now let's get to the official documents. So. The law of the land, um, starting in, um, um, in, in uh, 1699, uh, the first law was passed about for uh, in Wreckers um, and uh, in New Jersey, and uh, another one was passed in New York, where um, both state governments realized that it was necessary to uh, have the government oversee marine salvage uh, and not just be let it be left up to the competition of locals, um, because all it takes is one bad apple. Um, uh, and um, so uh, New Jersey enacted a law uh, concerning wrecks, 
uh, it was amended a number of times over the years, and one of the things that it provided for was that all of the counties that were on either the ocean or the major waterways, uh, like the Delaware, um, uh, all, all of those counties um, had to have a court-appointed um, uh, commissioner of recs um, who was responsible for coordinating handling marine salvage. Um, and in Monmouth County, at the time uh, that all this we're talking about, 1834, uh, um, the man's name is John S. Foreman. And um, there he is, John S. Foreman, Commissioner of Rex, April 19, 1832. So this is the man whose job it was to do the right thing with those ships that were wrecked off of Barnegat during those two years when things were happening that were in that hoax story. Um, so uh, Monmouth County at those days had five wreck masters, each with an appointed stretch of land starting from Sandy Hook all the way to Little Lake Harbor. Um, John Foreman served for more than 30 years he wore many hats, which was not unusual for people like that. So he was a judge, an inspector, a justice of peace, a farmer, and an innkeeper. Um, his father was a commissioner of recs before him, or after him, before him, and his son was a rec master after him. Um, and uh, he kept meticulous records, uh, a great many of which have survived and are still on file and can be viewed at the Monmouth County Historical Association. And these records tell a very different story about what happened with some of these shipwrecks. I'm going to go through all four of them, but we're going to take a one look at it. So one of the four shipwrecks that's mentioned in the Hope story of 1834 is the ship General Putnam. And supposedly, uh, you know, a hundred locals from Barnegat boarded the ship and carried everything off, threatening the crew with death if they interfered. Um, and so virtually nothing from that ship was saved. Well, what you're looking at right now is an actual accounting of um, uh, a cargo that was taken off of the General Putnam by people appointed by... John S. Foreman, essentially deputized and paid per state law to help remove, and you see that's casks of this, casks of that, and then um, there's values uh, that are uh, you know, estimated values, and then on the left you see people's markers, and you know where today people use their signatures, in those days people had a mark, and so this is an actual accounting of what happened to what was uh, saved from the General Putnam, and. Um, uh, so as you can see, it tells a very different story from the newspaper. Uh, once again, from the ship General Putnam, this is an account book of the John S. Foreman cave. So what he had to do was, you know, again, he had to marshal resources. I think I might need 10 men to help, uh, you know, pull all the salvage, off, pull all the cargo off the beach, um, bring up the dead bodies and, and uh, build the pine boxes and give them a decent burial. All the things that needed to be done in the, in the wake of a wreck. Uh, these people had to be paid and their contributions had to be noted. And so what we see is um, that they kept meticulous records about that. Now, what we're looking at here, again, now these are supposed to be rapacious, awful land pirates. Well, every one of those crossed out things there is one, two, three. So those are five survivors from the General Putnam, crew members that were able to get off the ship. Well, they weren't exactly murdered. They were put up in inns, paid for by Monmouth County. Uh, you see they're in Amboy, so Williams to, to Amboy to, for lodging. So so this is the amount of money that the county had to lay out, so, because where else are those people going to stay? There's no, there's no houses in Monmouth County. There's no there's nothing on the beach there. It's just a long, empty expanse, and their ship is wrecked. They don't have any family. They have no place to go. So the, the people were actually given very, very um, humane treatment, um, if not outright generous. And then... Uh, because uh, because this is how uh, John S. Foreman uh, operated, uh, it, you know, it, it performed his duties. Um, his files include a number of letters like this that are to the presiding judge of the court in Monmouth County that appoints the uh, commissioner of Rex, and it is to uh, recommend that the, uh, the the judge reappoint John S. Foreman as commissioner of Rex for another term. It goes on to extol him as being brave and. So you know, incapable of hiring a dishonest uh, helper, um, and and outlines that uh, in certain shipwreck situations, John S. Foreman was uh, responsible for saving up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of of goods and valuables. So the insurance brokers and insurance representatives felt that this guy was an incredible asset, and they that they went to bat for him over and over again. Which does not sound like a land pirate to me. So doesn't matter. You know, the hoax gets embraced as the truth. Um, and so around this whole time, the whole, the whole concept of wreckers takes hold in, in uh, uh, popular culture. 
now because the whole concept of records uh, kind of demise went you know five minutes demise uh, over 100 years ago most of this has as um, has, has been long and forgotten but in those years in those you know uh, 18th 17th centuries there were um, operas about records there were plays about records you saw at the beginning I, I uh, inserted a number of works of fine art that hang in pro, uh, uh, you know major museums um, that were all depicting um, scenes about records um, in Europe um, and uh, in the United States um, it's likewise we started to see plays um, and uh, dramas and uh, and what you see here was a book that, that came out a dime novel that came out um, in New Jersey about the Barnegat Pirates. Um, and uh, so, you know, once this stuff uh, takes root in popular culture, um, whether it was ever true to begin with or not, it largely gets forgotten. Um, so fast forward uh, just a few years, not very many. So the great storm of 1846, we all, this is a very, very famous shipwreck, a wreck of the John Minturn, a very sad, tragic event. Um, and 1846, February 15th, so a brutal winter storm, uh, 10 separate shipwrecks all the way from Sandy Hook to Barnegat Inlet. Now, some of them were deliberate, where ship captains literally ran their boats up onto the beach because they knew if they let nature take its course, they might be blown up onto a sandbar too far away to get everybody off. So some captains, you know, tried to uh, save themselves. Others were uh, un unable to. Uh, but there were 10 different shipwrecks um, just along that stretch. Uh, and um, uh, some of them were, uh, some of them had good outcomes in terms of uh, people and uh, cargo being saved, but others, specifically the John Minturn, were just horrible tragedies in which many, many people died, and uh, the whole thing took place in full view of the horrified spectators on land. So you had um, hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses to talk about, you know, what an incredible, incredible uh, uh, travesty and tragedy that was. Um, you know, so it was the subject of newspaper stories uh, across the country. And um, at first, um, the New York newspapers um, start out by defending the people um, of the area around where the John Minturn, um, uh, which was actually off of Deal, not even off of Barnegat. Um, so the New York Herald, uh, but you know, so the first the first stories about the Minturn in the New York papers say, now you don't have to worry about the locals anymore because the p land pirates who used to be there, they were all chased off. So there's only honest people there now. Well, of course, there were never any land pirates who were chased off, but the second round of stories made it sound like it was established fact that, that there were. So now it's just, well, well, there were land pirates, but not anymore. Well, it doesn't take long. 10 days later, right, was the storm on the 15th, now it's February 24th, the Bardia pirates, there be land rats and water rats, land thieves and water thieves. I mean pirates. That is a quote from Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And there it is. For many years prior to 1835, the Bartigat District of Beach on the coast of New Jersey was renowned for the piratical propensities of the inhabitants from Squire Platt. There's that guy from Indiana again, the wreck master, and his boon companions, the parson and doctor of the interior town down to the fishermen who lived upon the beach through all seasons, watching for and sometimes ensnaring their prey. Many a stout vessel has left her bones upon the beach. Well, back to that again. This time, people get ticked off. It attracts attention, and that's where Alexander Wartz of Hunterdon County files a resolution with the uh, governor of New Jersey saying, this, we have to get to the bottom of this. Uh, we have to find out if, if these accusations are true. And that's what he's saying, because either the residents of Barnegat are the worst scoundrels on the face of the earth, or else they are a much injured set of men. Governor Charles Stratton, he, he, acts, he acts immediately, he impanels the commission to the next day um, that after um, that, that uh, Senator Stratton um, files his um, uh, thing in, in, the, in the assembly, in the Senate rather. Um, and so the governor acts immediately and panels it to They go straight to Freehold, um, where they pull all the files, and then they go on a tour of all the wrecks from Sandy Hook down to, and they, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, Barnegat, and they have hearings where they interview survivors and principals and witnesses. Um, and when they were having those hearings, a funny thing happened. Some of the survivors and, and uh, principals on some of these ships who weren't even asked to be there heard about it 
and made their way there. Again, it's only been 10 days, 10, 15 days since the wreck. They hadn't had much of an opportunity to go anywhere uh, in February. Um, they, uh, they, they found their way to these hearings and put their stories on the record. And, and now the stories tell this very different perspective of heroism and bravery and risking lives um, of some of these people, some of whom were local, some of whom were the other rec masters. But again, uh, the John Minturn was a terrible tragedy because it was just too far away and the conditions were just too dangerous. Of course, the people on ship didn't see it that way. The people on the ship thought the people on shore needed to have a little more intestinal fortitude. And the people on shore said, I don't know why I should kill myself for you today. I don't know why I should. I, you know. So anyway, uh, we sometimes wonder uh, that the records that uh, John Foreman kept for all the other shipwrecks he worked on, uh, that um, most of the Mintern uh, papers of that type um, don't survive. But there is one file from the Mintern wreck that John uh, S. Foreman filed um, that does survive, and it is gruesome. Uh, we'll take a little closer look so you can see what this is. And if you look down at the very bottom, you'll notice that John S. Foreman has signed himself as Justice of the Peace as opposed to Commissioner of Wrecks. But let's take a look at what this is a little closer. This is, uh, so it's February 27th, 1846. This is a accounting of the dead bodies from the jo John Minturn and which ones were buried by whom. And so who had to be owed money for the handling of the corpses. Um, and so this is the kind of work that uh, John Foreman had to do. Um, and uh, imagine, imagine having to do that. Imagine risking your life um, and, uh, and getting a, a regulated uh, reward, you know, unlike the, um, you know, the, the wreckers of uh, the Caribbean where they could get substantial rewards, you know, these, the state, most of the money goes to the state. Uh, and, and John S. Foreman received a, 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 an annual stipend. Um, and uh, so uh, at any rate, um, the, once again, it's really, you know, th this is um, part of what was so tragic about it was that, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the disparity between the, the, the accounts of the people on the ship and on shore, the people on shore never get the benefit of the doubt. So the state Senate, Senate the state Senate did their job and um, fairly quickly came to this conclusion. Report to your excellency that the charges in the resolution upon which we act are accordingly to the best of our judgment upon the evidence, each and every one of them untrue, that there are no inhuman and guilty actors therein to be punished, and that the state ought to be released from the odium of such barbarity. And you know, for the most part, it was. Um, the thing is that from that point forward, we really didn't see a lot of stories about barning at pirates and, and land pirates and wreckers. Um, but that also was happening because a lot of other things were happening. And that this was really the beginning of the demise of wreckers uh, for other reasons. Now, one of the things that was the outcome of the, uh, the Minturn disaster was that this man, Dr. William Newell, um, uh, was a, a local resident of that area of Mama County and witnessed that tragedy and made it, uh, made it up his mind uh, to do something about it. And he got himself elected to, to the United States Congress and um, uh, using uh, a using a model of some life-saving stations that had been erected by the Humane Society in uh, Massachusetts, he was able to get a, um, a an allocation uh, in a federal appro appropriations bill of ten thousand dollars to be used for the purchase of equipment and the building of sheds um, to store life-saving equipment. And uh, th these initial um, sheds and life-saving equipment. Um, were put every uh, 10 miles from Sandy Hook down to um, uh, Barnegat. Um, and a lot of people um, tend to think that this is the start of the U.S. Life Saving Service, and it would eventually become that. But this is not the U.S. Life Saving Service. What this is, is this is still just the commissioner of This is still John S. Foreman and the same guys he was paying before. Now they've got some better equipment and they've got some sheds to hold it. That's the only thing that's changed. And so this gets lost a little bit, but uh, one of the more famous events that happened um, in, in 1850, uh, you know, now that uh, these, uh, uh, these, these volunteers um, uh, who have a better equipment um, that's, that's placed where uh, it needs to be, that they had some incredible um, accomplishments. And the, uh, the, um, the wreck of the airshare is one of the most um, incredible stories. The airshare um, uh, first was you know, just absolutely destroyed in a storm on, on New Year's Day off the coast of New Jersey. And as it floated close to the shore, uh, it had all had all its sails ripped apart, uh, dismasted, 
rudder uh, rudder didn't, didn't couldn't be used couldn't be steered and that ship got so close to shore that everybody on shore could see it but it was still moving and so the people on shore were screaming help us help us but it's like it's while it's still moving you can't you can't you can't really uh, do anything and so for 10 days that ship floated slowly northward um, over the currents um, as if a horrified crowd on shore followed it every step of the way until it finally came to a stop on a, uh, and keeled over on a, a sandbar. And for at that point forward, the, 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 the uh, commissioner of wreck and their people went into action using um, a cannon that fires a line to the ship. That allows them to rig up their Francis life car, life saving car, as you see being used there. Uh, again, there's lots of information on this, so we don't have enough time to go into all, the, all of this stuff and what it is. But the point is that given the right equipment, these people were able to do amazing work. They saved two, 199 of 200 people that were on board that ship that day. And you can see under harrowing conditions. The problem was that that initial $10,000 was all there was. So that equipment naturally didn't last too long. Uh, those sheds are 10 miles apart and that isn't, that's too far. And so there were, unfortunately there were too many uh, occasions where uh, ships were still wrecking and the people just either couldn't get there or if they could get there, they got there and the equipment didn't work or the equipment was just gone. Um, and so it just got worse and worse again until 1878 when Congress finally stepped up and uh, created the U.S. Life Saving Service. And a big part of that was making much, much larger uh, buildings. So this is a, the old Spermaceti Cove station. Um, and it's, uh, you see it's, it's much bigger um, and it was, they're designed to be um, refuges where if, if people survive a wreck, and they can come ashore. They have a, a place where these doors are open and there's blankets and water, and uh, they can they have a place where they can survive the elements for a few days. Um, and uh, so, so this was a major, major departure uh, in in and uh, and and they're every five miles along and every ten, and they start expanding it uh, further and further down the beach, um, all the way until uh, uh, you know eventually gets folded into the Coast Guard. So at the same time, what we're having, uh, at, you know, at, at, as the getting into eight, the late uh, uh, latter uh, half of the 19th century is that the uh, era of uh, soil is being replaced by the era of steam. And so these steam powered uh, motorized vessels have a lot more ability to control themselves. They have a lot more ability to navigate in storms. They have the much better ability to stop if they realize they're headed for breakers, they actually have a reverse. Um, uh, and um, so these ships were inherently significantly safer you can also take a look and see that this is a ship made of steel and so obviously metal boats uh, survived uh, various um, incidents much better than wooden ones would um, and so the fewer boats that wreck the less of a need there are for wreckers um, again over the over the decades significant improvements in lighthouses charts um, Things like buoys, um, different kinds of buoys, like this is a bell buoy. It's meant for places that are prone to fog uh, so that you can navigate in a zero visibility environment. So lots of these kinds of enhancements. Uh, you've got technology that eventually gets into sophisticated navigation systems. Like this is a very early Loran Sea that um, you know ships could use uh, to, uh, to navigate better than a sextant and, and the stars. And... Um, uh, and then eventually, of course, in 1915, the U.S. Life Saving Service gets combined with the Revenue Cutter Service and Lighthouse Keeping Service into the Coast Guard, a very formidable group and uh, um, pride of the country to this day. There are still wreckers, believe it or not, and, and they've got their own reality show because that's in everybody. Um, but nowadays, they don't, they don't work with commercial vessels as they did for centuries. Um, they work with um, uh, private vessels, and uh, this is largely... Uh, what uh, what happens? Um, it's just kind of like when you uh, you drive your car and maybe you hit a pothole and 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 uh, you know now you you're, you you know you lose a, a tie rod and now your car can't be driven. And what are you going to do? You got to call somebody to come tow your car someplace where it can get fixed. Well, that happens to boats all the time too, um, particularly because <laughs> there isn't the same uh, ethic about drinking and running a boat as there is with driving a car. People get absolutely smashed and then operate their boats. And I say that from a position of knowledge because my family's in the boatyard business for many years and they'll never go out of business because as long as, long as people get drunk and operate boats, those boats are gonna need to be uh, uh, salvaged. And, uh, and so that's what you see here. Uh, so you see a, a modern day wrecker um, 
refloating a sunken vessel and he's going to take it someplace. Um, so uh, that's on uh, Discovery Channel, and uh, I, I believe they have a new season coming up. <laughs> um, the uh, so um, you know uh, basically the whole concept of wreckers died down, um, and uh, you know the, the you know commercial vessels now are um, you know when they're in trouble they uh, you know that's where you have coast guards and 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 paramilitary type approaches um, and. Uh, so, but in our area here, well, we certainly do embrace our pirate myths, um, which I find intriguing. Um, just, we don't seem to embrace the wreckers myth anymore, but um, even though there's no evidence that there was ever any real major famous pirates here, there's a lot of pirate mythology. And so uh, even in Barnegat, so that's the, yeah, that's the Red Bank Regional High School mascot, which I find interesting. I wonder if they'd let me walk in the front door with a cutlass in my teeth like that. I, might set off the metal detectors. But seems like a curious mascot, given that pirates were truly murderers and the absolute worst people on the planet, uh, whereas the wreckers were falsely accused and were actually heroic and selfless. And uh, in Barnegat, they celebrate Pirate Day every day, and they're not talking about wreckers or land pirates. Uh, they are talking about buried treasure tribes, of course, which is there never were any. So instead of bracing their real um, uh, tradition and past, they uh, they continue to embrace the myth, but that's, I guess that's about as hum much as human nature is finding these keepers. Um, so with that, um, uh, any questions? Um, sorry, I went a little long. Thanks so much, John. Yes, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to submit them using the questions box in the dashboard and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, First question is, what about the period between the establishment of life-saving stations along the Jersey Shore in 1849 and creation of the Light Saving Service in 1878? Well, I just covered that. Um, that's what uh, that started with uh, Dr. Newell, uh, who witnessed the John Minturn disaster, and uh, on that basis decided he wanted to do something about it. So he ran for U.S. Congress, and in U.S. Congress, he was able to successfully um, get an uh, appropriation of $10,000 into a federal appropriations bill that was used to buy uh, the um, the uh, boats and uh, the, uh, the, um, the 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 wagons and uh, the ropes and hawsers and lines and to build the original sheds um, that were used um, in, in starting in 1850 uh, that came into play in the uh, say uh, the, the uh, um, saving the uh, air shear um, and. But that was not the U.S. Life Saving Service. U.S. Life Saving Service didn't come in until an act of Congress in 1878. Um, and that was because those original sheds were allowed to deteriorate and the equipment was allowed to uh, deteriorate, was not replaced. The men weren't properly trained. The, the stations were too far apart. So that original appropriation proved that, it, that the approach could work, but it needed significantly greater investment and significantly greater infrastructure and oversight. Is there an estimate of how much money and goods were quote unquote stolen <laughs> from these wrecks? No, because most of it's false accusations anyway. I, I see the part of the problem there is once again, you have a, you have a sailing ship um, that wrecks. Some of that stuff floats away. Some of it sinks. Some of it gets saved legitimately, but maybe some of it ends up in somebody's pocket illicitly. Um, and then some of it just gets ruined, and um, you, you know the accounting of all that is is very very sketchy. Uh, so I, I have never seen anyone even attempt that. Any. Uh... Not some of a, of a question, but this was really very enjoyable. Learned a lot. Thank you. You're very welcome. I don't see any more questions. So, Cindy, do you want to take us out? I will do that. Thank you so much, everyone who attended. We really appreciate it. John, thank you so much. Um, for those who have attended, there is we do have this recorded uh if you'd like to go through it again um i thought the photography or not the photography but the artwork in that was very well done as well um and it was very interesting to find out about you know 
all of this in the background. And I imagine that the research took quite a bit of time. So thank you so much. I was glad that I found this and uh, was able to be taken over to you. And I'll be visiting Monmouth County Timeline different times too, just to see the different stories uh, of interest. So well, thank I you like, very much. I would, yes. I would very much like to thank the State Library, um, not just for the opportunity for this uh, uh, talk, but um, I've been working with um, some of the research librarians um, on this project, and I cannot say enough about um, how great their work and assistance has been, especially uh, Caitlin Cook, who has really was um, a, uh, did a phenomenal job of making sure that, that we felt as though we had opened every dusty file drawer and looked in every cardboard box full of uh, file folders to make sure that we had tried to find every record um, relating to this uh, that we could. Um, and so um, I was very, very impressed by the, the staff of the State Library and wanted to just uh, make sure I got that out there. And thanks to Caitlin Cook for her help. Thank you, John. We appreciate it. And uh, yes, I would, uh, I've gone to our librarians many times and, you know, you think maybe, oh, no, don't do it because you're just working there. But, you know, I've gone in there very good at their research and they know what they're doing. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Very good. All right. have, a, have a good day, everybody. Come on.